Thank you very much, Tim. How's it going, everyone? Have a good day? Excellent, cool. So this is my talk. This is Making Your Mark in the Open Source Community. This is a, a talk I've been wanting to do for a little while. Um, it's rather philosophical. It's um, based on my own experiences. I've gotten into uh, open source in a big way with my work and my free time. So I, I, I've, I've done a few things. I've learned a, things, a few things on the way, and I thought I'd like to share that with all of you. So I was going to try and find an open bottle of source for open source, but that's the best I could do under Creative Commons Zero. Um, this is a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. So the first one is, why should we open source? Why, what is the benefits of it? Why does it benefit us as an industry? And the next one is, if you want to do your own project, if you, if you actually have some code you want to share to the world, how exactly do you go about setting it up? What, what are the components you need? What are the, what are the most essential bits? And basically, how do you actually make a nice looking project? And finally, once you've actually got all that, how do you actually go on maintaining it? And if you want, participating in other projects at the same time. So really quick introduction about me, probably not that necessary. Uh, as, as you saw in that ludicrous display earlier, um, a lot of people like to call me Tom. Um, it's actually Tim. I've had people come up to me and apologize for actually legitimately thinking I was called Tom now. One person blamed it on the beer. It was great. Um, like Tim said, I've been building apps for a while. I was so amazed when the iPhone 3G launched and it was like, wow, this is a computer with internet in my pocket. This is going to enable so many th new things. It's been fascinating. Like, and this entire industry that we're basically in now is built around that, which is a really fantastic thing to think about, considering it's not even 10 years old. It's almost 10 years old. I've been to seven DevOps conferences. I've presented, I think, at six. Um, this is by far my favorite conference. I've, I, this is where I got basically my, my, my entry into the industry. So this is my, this one has a very special place in my heart. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad everyone else come, come, came along to DevOps this year as well. It's, it's so great. It's been around for 10 years, which is very long for Australian conferences. I'm currently working for Realm. If, if anyone, has anyone here not heard, heard of Realm? No? So, oh, there's one, one hey, you know what Realm is, okay. Uh, if you haven't heard of Realm before, really quick, really quick pitch. It's like core data, but with less tiers. It's uh, really good. <laughs> um, working for a database company, in my free time I do the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, uh, um, UI libraries. So that's basically what I'm gonna talk about today, basically my experiences with them. Um, I really have, I really have a great time hacking the, um, the UI of iOS and seeing what's possible with 60 frames and now um, 120 frames of animation. And I'm just going to put that out there as a bit of a, a bit of a icebreaker or a bit of a troll feeder. Um, I still prefer Objective C. I've got my reasons. I'm half, I'm half on the. Oh gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Applause, really? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So just, to, just to. Show that I'm not like just making up my libraries. Here's, here's, here's a few of them I've made. Um, my, my, my very first one I ever made was one called a web view controller. The concept was if you've got an app and you need to show some web content, you need a back and a forward button. That wasn't possible before iOS 9 without writing your own custom code. This one is backwards compatible down to iOS 5, so it still compiles on the original iPad, which is um, a bit amazing and terrifying. And it's been used by quite a few companies. I didn't even realize this until recently. Apparently, the, I don't know how they pronounce it, the Imager, the Imger. Who thinks it's Imgur? It's a few. Who thinks it's Imgur? Who has no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, there you go. Um, the Imgur app is using it in their um, thing, which is absolutely fantastic. I use that thing all day for my, every day for my dank meme consumption purposes. Um, anyway, my most popular library is I made a, a decent homage to the Photos app on iOS. It lets you crop um, a UI image if you have any re need, need for like doing on-device uh, image editing, like profile pictures and things like that. Um, this is really fascinating to learn how to do like the, the, the translucent blur effects and everything in the background. Um, that one's been really, really, really well. And one I just released a week ago, um, this is brand new, as I, I derived some very creative inspiration from one of the system iOS UI designs. Um, hopefully you all know what it, what it is. And um, yeah, that one's, that one's up on GitHub now as well. So um, I don't know if this was actually ever going to make it in an iOS app because um, it, uh, Apple have a rule about not copying system functionality, so that one might need a bit of, a bit of design tweaking. And just for the most part, Realm is 99% uh, uh, open source. We do everything out in the open. It's, um, it's really nice because everyone else can actually look in. People, we invite people to, uh, to uh, contribute, um, and it's just really good because it, it makes this really transparent, and for other reasons I'll go into, it's, it's really good that, um, it, that all the code is open source there, except for a few, uh, a few things. Cool, so why should we do open source? What is the benefit? I was talking to someone last night and they're like, the concept is we put up code for free and strangers can use it for free and not pay us money. So why, do, why would we even go through that effort? So there's a really nice check, uh, tech, uh, quote Isaac Newton made a while ago that I thought was really, really, really profound and really, really applicable to software. We can do what we do now because of the, the work that has come before us. And this is really important in software because basically what we do is cont continually refining upon the things that have been laid down in front of us. 
So just get, just get just into that really philosophical section of this talk. So writing software, it's hard. Now that's, that's never ever, ever like, you know, convince ourselves it's easy. It's actually really hard. We think about what software is, it's basically we tricked a rock into thinking by shooting it with lightning, <laughs> more or less. So just you know, everything we do is actually kind of magical. It's amazing it works at all. When you get down to it, what, it, what software really is, is it's, it's, it's creating solutions to establish problems. An app is a, a solution to a problem. Every single bit of code in there is fulfilling some kind of solution. And because of that, uh, and I'll go into this really artistic sense, it's not really, uh, not, it's not as logical as you think because there's many different ways to solve and a given problem. And there's no really right answer, no wrong answer. There might be a terrible answer sometimes, but really what the most appropriate answer is whatever, whatever is faster. And, that, and whatever faster means could be whatever you want. Faster to write, faster to read, faster to, to execute. Faster is just faster. And the good thing is um, if someone else has already solved the problem before ahead of time, then this can save you time, which is very, very good because you want to create apps, that, apps as quickly as you can and create good, good experiences for customers. So when you when when you when you want when you have like an idea, it's like I want to do this, but um, I, there's no software out there for me to, to, to I can just, just just use. You then end up having to reinvent the wheel. Like if you yeah, like I, like like as, as I said, like I use a lot. I write a lot of libraries that um take uh, take a lot of the private aspects of iOS and try and make it more public because they're they're things that iOS don't give you. But ostensibly, this is reinventing the wheel because obviously it's a, it's a solved problem. But as a result of that, we've, we've started seeing a lot of open source start bubbling to the surface. So there's a lot of really, really good ones out there. Um, AF for networking for Objective-C, Alamo Fire, a whole range of, of ones that make auto layout a bit easier to work with. Just over the time, people have started solving these problems and started contributing their code to the public. And because of this, because there's this giant wealth of open source code out there, we can take those and we can actually make better, co better code, better apps a lot more quickly. So going into that, and the benefits of open source, like I just said, if there's a library out there you can already use, it saves reinventing the wheel, which is really nice. It feels great when you know you're not just writing code for the sake of not being able to um, use the library. Obviously, it saves development time. You just drop, drop a pre-made solution in, and all the, all the things have been taken care of already. It enables credit collaboration. When the code's out in the open, everyone can come in and help. People can submit bug reports. People can submit changes. People can, can provide optimizations. So it's really good because it invites more people in. Obviously, because the code is being reused, and if it starts getting more popular and going out to other projects, it means that it starts getting more battle-hardened and battle-tested in other applications. It means you can find out bugs, you can find out weaknesses in the APIs, you can do all sorts of things that just make the thing better. Something that uh, we don't really realize, but, but is actually really, really cool, is it's a great learning resource for newcomers. So if someone's coming in, they just want to know how, how, how iOS works, how APIs can interact with each other. If you put an app up that's open source, that's a really good learning resource because you can go through, you can step through, you can see exactly what's happening, you can set breakpoints. It's, it's fantastic as a learning resource. This is one that was actually kind of particular to Realm. Back when Realm launched in 2014, the giant C++ core that we use for the file format handling was actually closed source. And a lot of people didn't want to use us for that because um, basically if you, if you just drop a giant blank binary into an app, you have no idea what's in there. And Apple actually have said this in their own talks at WWDC that you shouldn't really use bi giant binaries. You have, you have no, no idea what's in there because obviously you can invite malware, you could have like security flaws, you could have really inefficient code. I think one of the Google ad APIs does a lot of stuff on the main thread, so importing it actually just degrades performance inherently by having it. And yeah, it's just, just that having, having all your code open so you can actually build from source and bring it all in lets you really guarantee that what you're writing is, is the code that you want and it's really it's the best quality that you're, you're after. And as a result of all this, software gets better, and which is really good. We have, we have better, better solutions, better battle-hardened battle code, and basically means that um, we can make better apps, more or less. Okay. So the next, the next slide is just basically a really, a, really, a, really, um, a really profound thing. One of my friends over in um, California, an, an AUC alumni actually, said to me once, we're talking about open source, the thing is, we take advantage of all these amazing and take advantage of all these amazing libraries out there for free. Basically, other people put their code out, and we can take that code and put it in our apps. We can charge money for those apps, all for free. So a really profound quote um, that my friend said to me was, you should always strive to give more than you take. So in that sense that if you, if you use a lot of open source code, you could also consider doing it yourself. And the next slide, as it comes up, says, we all have something unique we can bring to the table. We all have different skills. Some are, some are designers, some are developers. But the, the thing is, we could all contribute something and bring in, bring out our own experiences. We can actually make the overall space a lot better. So that's the reason why I like to open source my code. 
Um, I saw a really cool talk in 2015 by a chap called Orta Therox. He is one of the contributors, one of the core contributors of CocoaPods, and he works at a company called Artsy. So Orta actually had a really interesting um, philosophy. He likes, to go around, he likes to go around and talk about at conferences, which is a concept of open source by default. So a lot of companies like to just inherently keep their code co closed source because of pr proprietary reasons. But if there's no real reason for the code to be kept private, then you should just, just make it open source and develop it in the open. Now, in the particular sense of Artsy, their value lies because Artsy is a, an, art, an artwork platform. Where people can sell artwork. So their main value is a giant web service stack where all the processing happens via web services. So it doesn't make, there's no skin off their nose by making all the clients, the iOS clients, open source just by the fact that they can develop in the open, they can invite contributions, and they've actually made a really cool, they said they made a really cool mocking suite where you can build, you can build the, the app and use like complete mocks without actually interacting with the real data in a completely separate sense. Now obviously, open source by default doesn't work for everything. If you have a commercial app, you can't really open source that because people will take it and just re-upload it to the app store. So it depends on, on basically your use cases. But at the very least, if, whenever you start a new project, think about if you could actually just do it in the open if it would actually be any of, any of any detriment to you by doing that. OK, so. If you're going to start doing a new library, um, basically, where, what do you have to do? Where do you have to go? What, what files do you need? What, what type of assets and what kind of like, documentation do you need? Platform. This one's easy. GitHub. Uh, there's a few other ones. There's Bitbucket, there's GitLab, but, but GitHub it seems to be the, the one that, that won. Um, if you haven't seen the, the keynote at WWDC yet, GitHub is now integrated directly into Xcode. All the, all the dependency managers for iOS and macOS are on GitHub, like CocoaPods and Carthage. Like, it seems to be the place to go to put your code. Language, this is an interesting one. Um, so what language should you write it in? I've got a few, I've got a few reasons for both, a few, re a few pros and cons of both. Objective-C still works. It's great. I can, I can download a library from 2008 and run it in Xcode 9, and it'll, it'll still build. It'll look terrible, but it'll still build, which is um, amazing. A bit of an unfortunate thing about Swift is because we've gone through so many source iterations now. <clears throat> if you download a library from 20, that wasn't updated since 2014, it just won't run. You have to do multiple code migrations. Which is a bit sad because now we have like a, a section of GitHub which is just full of like dead, unmaintained Swift libraries that just won't work anymore. Another cool thing I found out is a lot of people actually can't update to the latest version of Swift. I've actually had a few people contact me and say like my company moved to Swift 2 and we can't afford to move to Swift 3, which is an unfortunate circumstance. But making a library in Objective C is great because it works with every version of Swift. Swift 1 through 4, it'll just work, which is really nice because you can make a, a, a library which is truly universal for the iOS platform, macOS. That being said, Objective-C is quite old. Um, it takes a lot of time to, to write specific things that take like one line of code in Swift. So you are obviously being more verbose. And because of its dynamic nature, it's very easy to write bugs if you don't know what you're doing. So there are a few downsides to Objective-C, which Swift fixes. And another thing you realize is, I'll have no illusions about this. Writing Objective-C code at this point is probably just accruing technical debt, because at some point it will go away. So it's probably not the best thing to keep doing Objective-C at the moment. But at the same time, there's still benefits versus Swift. Swift is, of course, the future. This is where we're all heading in the, in, the, in, the, in the Apple technology platform future. It's great. It's easy to write. It's very fast to learn. It's great. It's, it's so flexible. You can do all sorts of crazy things that you, can't, you just literally can't do in Objective-C. Uh, but the most important one is you can actually write a lot, a lot more code a lot more quickly. And I think someone, what was it? Someone, um, was it the person who wrote GPU image said that they rewrote GPU image 2 in Swift, and the code base was literally half the size of Objective-C. So, it just means you can create new things a lot more quickly, which is great. A few downsides is it's um, source compatible. You have, we've had to do migrations. That might have cleaned itself up at this point, so it's not so much of an issue anymore. But um, 
at the same time, something to be aware of. Uh, there's no ABI compatibility yet, which is a bit of a downside. They've been promising it for two versions now, but um, hopefully it will be there soon. What that means is at the moment, you need to, if you have a, a pre-compiled version of Swift, a binary, it has to be compiled with the exact same version of the compiler that you, you uh, are writing your own app in. So that is down to like Swift 3.0.1 levels. And we, we, we handle this at Realm by shipping like five different binary versions, but obviously that means that's a lot of effort, that's a lot of setup, a lot of automation. You can't really do that manually. Another problem is it's still quite, still quite immature. I don't think anyone could say they're a Swift expert just yet because it keeps changing. I guess Chris Latner could. Um, it's still quite changing. So, so one thing that might have been accepted in one version of Swift might not be accepted just yet. So it's still a, a state of flux. So it's still quite new. It's still developing. And as a result, it might even be more time consuming down the line because you don't know where it's going to change. OK, so if you're going to upload a new repo to GitHub, what are the main things you need? So the code for the library is a good start. You need one of them. One thing that's really critical that some people forget is needed an, an example app, just a really, really quick one view controller to show it so people can just download it, run it, and see what it, what it looks like. Hopefully it still works. Um, you know, if, if, it, if, it die, if it dies down the line, you should update it really quickly. Uh, screenshots is another thing. Most people don't put in screenshots, but just to give like, some, some sense of what, what, what the person will be downloading when they're checking it out, a screenshot of, of the library is really, really important. If you've, you've got the time, our video is really good as well. A readme file, this is kind of guaranteed. GitHub will show readme files at the root of the repo, so it's always good to have one of them. Yeah, it can you still do markdown? And a license file to show that what, what sort of license your code is under. This is kind of like demanded by most of the um, dependency managers out there. On the topic of dependency managers, there's two. There's CocoaPods and Carthage. Let me, uh, let me just put it out there. Who, who's a CocoaPods person? Cool, that's about half the room. Who's a Carthage person? Yeah, that's about half the room. Who just doesn't care and just drags the source files and, yep, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> cool. Well, when it comes to dependency managers, it's pretty easy to support, support both. And when Swift Package Manager comes out for fully, um, you can do SPM um, support as well. But I usually just lean towards CocoaPods because I'm CocoaPods and I, I add Carthage support when someone notices there's no Carthage support. Um, but for the most part, most people do use CocoaPods, which is nice. But yeah. Supporting both is relatively trivial, so like CocoaPods is like one extra file and a, and a push to the server, and Carthage just makes sure it, it can compile dynamically, and that's it. For a readme file, there's a few things you need to really put in there for it to be really rich and, and, and complete. A title, a subtitle, and a description, just to really give like a, a, a quick blurb, a, a quick pitch of what your library does, and a quick description of, of more in more detail of, of how it works. F uh, a screenshot, like I said, very important. Feature list, go through and just really quickly point out the, the main, the main, the main uh, advantages of using this library and the things it's capable of doing that others might not be capable of doing. Very important, which versions of iOS and macOS it can support. Um, ideally, the lower you can go, the better, but it just depends on what APIs you're using. Installation instructions is still kind of important, especially if pe there are people out there who do manual source uh, installation just to, to tell them which files they need, like which source files, which resource files. Sample code is also very good. So it's like a really quick hello world. Like this is the bare minimum amount of code. You need to throw it up on the screen or whatever. Like actually go through. Um, if you want to do more in detail sample code, we, uh, GitHub also has a wiki feature, which is really useful for that. If people want to start contributing pull requests to the, to the library, what sort of things that, that, that you'd, you'd like them to do beforehand? Just like a really quick blurb on like how to contribute to it. And more, most importantly, the license agreement. So obviously like what license this, um, this, this uh, library is under. On that note, license, which is the best license to use? Let me just prefix it by saying I'm not a lawyer. So la 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 la, all that. So don't sue me, please. Um, some people, what some, some people don't realize is copyright is automatic. If you don't choose a license, that doesn't mean you've just given it away for free. That means you've actually just reserved exclusive rights to yourself, and technically no one else is allowed to use it. So it's always best to actually explicitly say which license it's under because that actually dictates what the restrictions apply to the library, and, that, and, then, and, you, and you're also implicitly giving your permission for others to use it. Don't use GPL. Um, GPL is completely, for, if you can go through and look on the internet for all the crazy debates behind it, but the, the TLDR is GPL does not work with the App Store model. You cannot ship GPL code on the App Store at all. So you can use GPL if you want to like, do like the Oracle model, where you have like a commercial version of your software and like a non-commercial version, and you want people to buy the commercial version. So you can say, like, you, can, you can play with it, and then when you want to upload to the App Store, you have to use a different license. But for the most part, if you're doing an open source library, don't, don't ever use GPL. Apache is the one that Realm uses. That's um, a little bit more restricted than most ones, but that's basically because there's, there's some patent uh, imp implications in there. But for smaller projects, MIT is the best. That, that, one, that one's really quick and easy, and it's the most, I think it's the most popular at this point. 
This is something I actually don't do very well. Um, I need to get better at it, is keep a changelog. Whenever you actually add new features, make sure you actually put a note in it in the changelog to make sure that people are aware that if there's a bug that was uh, harassing people, that it's been fixed. If there's a new feature people have been asking for, it's in there. This is really good because it just lets people keep up to date with what's actually been happening with the, um, the library. And this is also really useful if you're actually going to break an API. You actually tell people that the API is going to break, so um, this is what you have to do to get around it. And like I said, highlights bug fixes. I found a really cool website, keeperchangelog.com, that actually just sends you, like you can just download a completely blank one with all the little bits and pieces already set up. So it's very easy just to, to make a pre-made a pre -made one and just go, go from there. On that note, releases. Releases works in, Git, in GitHub. I don't know about the other ones, but it works by when you actually assign a tag to a commit, that becomes a release. <coughs> so you can say like this specific commit version is where I'm actually setting a hard version increment. Uh, I didn't mention it in the, in the slides, but you should also use, you should use Semantic versioning for um, for all of your uh, um, your versions. So like just you know, I think it's the, the first one's major changes, second one's like minor changes, and the third one's incremental changes. Um, you can use releases to actually pre-compile versions of the frameworks. So you just drop it in, um, which is really nice. And it's usually best just to put the changelog entries um, into the releases as well, so it's wind up. CI. There was a really great talk yesterday about CI. Um, I really recommend to see it. Um, like Patrick was saying yesterday. Um, Travis is, I think Travis is amazing. It's, it's like there's no excuse not to have uh, CI because um, if people contribute code and they don't test it properly, something will break. And it's, it's really nice that Travis can actually call that out and pick it up really easily. It's free for open source projects. All you have to do is drop a .travis.yaml file into the repo and then hook it up to Travis, and it's basically automatic after that. Um, and you get like full integration into GitHub. So you actually get like a little window that says like Travis is testing, Travis has said it's, it's passed or failed. Um, it's just, and yes, it's Travis YML file like So I really recommend Travis. There's really no excuse not to have CI in your, in your libraries because it's, it's free, and if you, if you have a private um, project, it's, it's also relatively cheap as well. Okay, finally, last section. How to actually get, this is good because this is like from, from someone running their own projects, but also in participating in other projects. These are, these are um, the kind of things you need to be aware of. Platform updates. iOS 11, High Sierra, around the corner. A pile of stuff broke in my libraries because Apple changed the status bar. For some reason, I have no idea why they would change the status bar. In fact, some people know that I have a, I have a rich history with the status bar in Apple. Um, the status bar is the bane of my, anyway. Um, so yeah, stuff will probably break. Always check, test as soon as possible. Um, try and be as thorough as you can. Uh, yeah, um, basically Apple give you the betas ahead of time for this reason, so you can test all your stuff out, make sure it still works. If you've got really re reason, if you've got really re weird reasons, file a radar, because it might actually be a bug on the iOS side. I submitted a radar about the status bar, and I got a, a response back saying that's actually intended functionality, so that's all right then. Test new hardware if it's possible. I hear there's a new shiny iPhone around the corner, which would be really nice to test on so soon. Our next one is bug reports. U users are, are kind of innocent in the fact that if you don't really give them enough context, they won't tell you exactly what, um, what went wrong. So I, I, I used to get bug reports like, it doesn't work on my iPhone. It's like, OK, what iPhone? What version of iOS? What were you doing? So. GitHub is really cool because it lets you actually create an issue template file that when you go to create an issue, it'll pre-fill it with your thing saying like, these are the things I need. Please fill out your issue with these bits of information so I can actually figure out what's going on. Um, and for the most part, just I, I'm sure this doesn't need to go, this goes without saying, but just remember to be polite. Like if they, if they, if they just like, it, it doesn't work in a, in a really terse way, like it doesn't work, please help. Make sure that, you know, just be polite and say like, okay, it doesn't work for these reasons and things like that. So there's, there's, there's codes of conduct in GitHub um, that's always recommended. And just remember that always keep always be polite. But yeah, sometimes we have like there's, there have been like really heated debates in certain issues in repos I've, I've been in. Other ones are feature requests. Um, for the most part, people are really nice about this, but I have had a few people demand features, um, and sometimes they're actually quite unreasonable features. One person said like that crop library is nice, but can it do video instead of pictures? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so. Feature requests come, they might be unreasonable, you have to let them down nice and say like, that's a great idea, but it's not technically feasible, things like that. Um, it's okay, like I said, it's okay to refuse. Um, a, great, a great person called Felix Krauss likes to say, that's not in line with my vision, which is a really good way of saying like, that's a great feature request, but that's not the direction the project's going in. A great thing about being an open source, you can say, that's a great idea, but I don't have time to do it. So you can like attach a tag to it in the issues thing and say like, PR requested. So like, that one's up for grabs if anyone wants to try and do it themselves. And I've never done this before, but people say it's something you can do. If someone really wants you to add a feature, you could probably say, like, I'll do it if you give me some money. So it becomes a consulting, it can actually become a, a paid kind of job at that point. Uh, pull requests. So people can 
create their own features and then submit it to your library and you can approve them and bring them in. That's awesome, that's great. People are actually engaged in your library, people are actually liking it. Um, that being said, there might be legal implications. So a lot of, a lot of big companies like Facebook and even Realm do it. They, they're required to sign a, a contributor license agreement before you can accept it for legal reasons. Um, sometimes it is a bit uh, like, how do I explain this? Like sometimes people will just come out of nowhere without talking to you before and say like, I have this great feature I wrote without telling you at all. It's all done. I put in all this effort and we're like, we're like, oh, we were actually doing that internally. Or, oh, uh, we, we, can't, we can't support that because we're about to bring in a new feature. So it is kind of awkward when someone does a lot of work and you're like, I, we can't accept that. So what I always like to say is if you're going to do a PR, always open an issue first and say like, hey guys, I've got this um, idea. How does that sound? And is this the right way about, going, do, about doing it? But the, the, the takeaway is um, pull requests are awesome, but you just need to be really careful about how to manage them. And just one, one more slide before I, um, before I finish up. Um, so I mentioned Felix Krauss. Felix is an awesome guy. I like it how people pre-prepared him. So when I actually met him, he was like, oh, I've heard of you. Your name's Tom. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but he's a lovely guy. He did a talk uh, this year in Japan at TriSwift um, talking about his open source library, which is called Fastlane. Who here knows what Fastlane is? Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, cool. He, he went into great detail about how he manages Fastlane because he has a lot of contributors. It's a much bigger scale than the kind of things that I've been working on, possibly even Realm works on. And he's created a really nice series of systems to actually handle the, the, the issues and the features and actually making sure that things get done and releases. And he, he, um, the, the talks on the Realm website um, just look like Felix Krauss open source video. You should get it in Google. I really recommend watching that. It's fantastic. Cool. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Now go make something awesome. And if we have any time, I can take some questions. But apart from that, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>